أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has given us the توفيق to hold another session on the tafsir of سورة الفرقان uh, for those of you who are following following along we have reached verse number 14 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن تدعوهم لا يسمعوا دعاءكم ولو سمعوا ما استجابوا لكم ويوم القيامة يكفرون بشرككم ولا ولا ينبئك مثل خبير If you invoke them, meaning the idols, the false gods, if you invoke them, They do not hear your supplication. And if they heard, they would not respond to you. And on the day of resurrection, they will deny your association. And none can inform you like one acquainted with all matters. This verse is a continuation of ayah number 13, the last part of Verse number 13, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ تَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ as, as for those whom you call upon besides him, مَا يَمْلِكُونَ مِن قِطْمِيرٍ Those that you call upon besides Allah, they do not even possess a date stone, meaning they have no control. They have no sovereignty. They have no power. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is addressing one of the biggest problems in Meccan society and in Arabian society as a whole. And that is the problem, the ideological problem of idol worship. Now now Mecca, of course, this surah is a Meccan surah. And it is addressing a theological problem in Meccan society, and that is the worship of idols. Now, interestingly, as many of you know, Mecca is was the center of monotheism, meaning historically, Mecca has monotheistic roots, going back to the time of Adam, alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, for example, he says, in the awwala baytin, Indeed, the first house of worship established for mankind was that at Bekka. Bekka, which is another name, or it's the ancient name for the city of Mecca. Blessed and a guidance for the worlds. So Mecca was initially a monotheistic society with Adam and his progeny. And then gradually, uh, the Meccans, you know, the, the people of that region, they devolved into shirk, into polytheism. And the, the narrations mentioned that it started because people, you know, after people died, they would have, you know, physical representations of pious people. Like, for example, the statues that the idols that the people of Nuh, or part, uh, some, some of the communities at the time of Nuh, they would worship idols that were statues of pious people who lived in the past. And then gradually over time, the, the veneration of these pious people turned into to worship. And as time passed, of course, people began, especially in Mecca, they started to worship idols made of 
stone, made of wood, and even made up made of food. There were some idols that were constructed of dates. They would take dates and they would make them into paste and they would form an idol that they would worship. And you know, sometimes if there was a famine, they would end up eating a portion of their idol or the entire idol. Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he reminds them of something that should be obvious, you know, and, and this is really remarkable that something as obvious, as obviously wrong with with as idol worship is is something that is accepted with would accepted without question. You know, if you were to take, if you were to do a survey in Meccan society, the overwhelming majority of them would, would consider idol worship to be logical, to be meaningful, and they, they wouldn't see any issue with it. So, so this shows you that the human beings, you know, throughout history, they have agreed upon, they have accepted things that have no logical basis whatsoever. And especially today in the, the, uh, the Trump era, as we call it, you know, people they subscribe to ideas and to beliefs and to conspiracy theories that have no basis in reality. And you might see people in millions who adopt certain, certain ideas and certain beliefs without any evidence. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially tells them that these idols, which are made of stone, which are made of wood, made of food, they're inanimate. You make dua, you supplicate to them. They're not able to hear you because they're inanimate objects. They don't have the, the ability to hear. And even if they did, hypothetically, let's say that they had the ability to hear your calls and your supplications, they are still powerless to respond and come to your aid. Because anything that you ascribe to... Uh, ascribe to Allah doesn't even possess something as minute as a date stone now interestingly at the end of the verse we see that these things, these idols these objects of worship will be brought on the day of judgment and Allah says وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكْفُرُونَ بِشِرْكِكُمْ وَلَا يُنَبِّئُكَ مِثْلُ خَبِيرٌ the objects of worship, the idols, whatever was taken as a god, will disassociate themselves from those who took them as deities. So the act of ascribing partners to God is so egregious, is so egregious that the idols and all other false gods, even if they happen to be human beings, whatever they may be, they will completely disassociate themselves from those who took them as deities. Because it's such a monstrosity, it's such a monstrous statement or monstrous claim that even the idols, even those things that were worshipped, don't want to have anything to do with those who worship them. In Surat Yunus, ayah number 28, we read, وَيَوْمَ نَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ نَقُولُ لِلَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا مَكَانَكُمْ أَنْتُمْ وَشُرَكَاؤُكُمْ On the day, we will gather them all together, the day of judgment. Then we will say to those who associated others with God, to mushrikeen, remain in your place. Now Allah is going to, he's going to ask them to stand for questioning. Remain in your place. You're not, you cannot go forward. It's like a checkpoint. You have to be interrogated. Remain in your place, you and your partners. You took certain things as gods. Okay, you and what you ascribed as partners with God, you will be. You will have to stand for questioning. Allah says that we will separate the, the worshipers, the mushrikeen, from that which they used to worship. And their partners... And their partners, and in many cases, the the idols, the, the the people who were worshipped besides God, many of them are innocent. That's 
This is perhaps why they're separated, because Allah doesn't want to group them together, that you're innocent. Then we will separate them. Because, for example, Jesus السلام, was worshipped as a deity, but he's innocent. He never claimed to be. The wood, the stone, these objects that were worshipped, they're innocent. These things themselves used to do tasbih to Allah. Then we will separate them and their partners will say, Ma kuntum iyana ta'budun. You did not used to worship us. You did not used to worship us. They will denounce, they will disassociate the mushrikeen from them because of how egregious that act is. And none can inform you, O Muhammad, like one acquainted with all matters. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can inform us about these matters, especially issues that pertain to alamul ghayb, to the unseen. Since this is information that we cannot gather through deductive reasoning, through through rationale, through we, we can't. These are not things that you can logically come to 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 understand. Now we can rationally deduce the existence of life after death. You can use certain intellectual arguments to prove the existence of life after death, as it relates to divine justice and so on and so forth. But we are unable to speak definitively about the specifics of that world because we don't have access to it. So such knowledge is solely with, with God. Now, what is the meaning of the name of Allah, which is one of Asma al Husna, Al Khabir? One of the names, one of the 99 names is Al Khabir. What does it mean for Allah to be Khabir? Al Khabir is the one who knows everything, the one whose knowledge nothing can escape. So he has an all encompassing knowledge. But more specifically, he knows the essence of everything, he knows the innermost reality of everything. Now, some scholars they distinguish between Al Alim and Al Khabir. Al Alim is general, it connotes knowledge. Allah knows the apparent and he knows the hidden. But khabir refers to knowledge that is applied to things that are typically hidden. They're not accessible. So, for example, knowledge of the hereafter, it's, it's something that's hidden. So Allah is khabir. He is well acquainted with those things that are not accessible to uh, to others. It's not accessible to him. So he has the innermost knowledge of things that are associated with the hidden, with the unseen, with the inaccessible. So he is Al-Khabir. Verse number 15. Ya antum O mankind, you are the ones in need of God. You are poor before God. You are in a state of poverty before God. So that is who you are. While God is the self-sufficient, the praiseworthy. Ya nas. This applies to all people. Rich, poor, male, female. Elderly, the young, the knowledgeable, the weak, the strong, the... everyone. All human beings are fuqara. And this quality of faq is not a temporary or an accidental quality. It is an inherent quality. So in the same way that Allah is inherently self-sufficient and He's inherently all-powerful, you and I and all human beings and all creatures, we are inherently needy. We are inherently dependent and poor. So all human beings are poor and needy before God. Even if you're the wealthiest person in the world. So faqir here, we're not talking about, you know, poor 
and rich in the material sense. Even someone who's wealthy is faqir. Why? All human beings are poor and needy before God with regard to being brought into existence. You needed someone to bring you into existence. You didn't bring yourself. So you are faqir in the sense that you, you were in need of something outside of yourself, something other than you to bring yourself into existence. And you are also in need of sustenance. So you are in need of existence because you are not a necessary existent. You are a contingent existent. You are a contingent being. To exist is not an inherent, it is something that was acquired. So you are faqir because you were brought into existence and you are faqir because you continuously need God to supply you with the blessing of existence. So this state of faqr, this state of poverty, of neediness is perpetual. It never, it never ends. Even in Jannah we are fuqara. We are in need of God. We are always in need of Allah. We will never be independent of God. It's impossible. There is no such thing as an independent creature. We are all dependent. We, we are dependent on Him to bring us into existence and we are dependent upon Him to preserve our existence. So if you think of it like a candle, the candle can only be lit if fire touches the wick, if it's ignited. And the candle will only continue to burn if it's protected from any winds or any anything that will extinguish it. Our relationship with Allah is the same. We need Him. We need Him to exist and to sustain our existence. When it comes, you know, and this is a beautiful statement from Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, where he speaks about. The, the concept of proving God's existence using his creation. And the Imam very beautifully says, he says, كَيْفَ يُسْتَدَلُّ عَلَيْكَ بِمَا هُوَ فِي وُجُودِهِ مُفْتَقَرٌ إِلَيْكَ How is something that depends on you for its existence used to prove your existence? You say, for example, I believe in Allah because I saw the intricacy of the human cell. Imam al Hussein, now there's nothing wrong with this, but Imam al Hussein says, How amazing is it? That, how astonishing is it that we use something that depends on you for its existence to prove your existence? Kayfa yustadadu alayk? Poverty and neediness, فقر, as I said, is a permanent quality of everything other than Allah. Everything. Jibra'il is faqir. Mika'il is faqir. I am faqir. You are faqir. Rasulullah is faqir. We are all fuqara. Ya ayyuha nafs, antumul fuqara in Allah. But the way to truly be enriched is to connect yourself to the self-sufficient. This is the beauty of salah. Salah, five times a day, this contingent being connects himself to the necessary being. This impo- the, the, need, the needy connects himself to the needless. So this is why salah for... Those who know salah, who understand the power of prayer, for them it is liberation. Those moments of connection with Allah are moments of pure liberation. Because we're all limited. We're limited in every sense of the word. So to have the opportunity to connect to the unlimited is is really a profound experience. So faqr is a permanent quality. It's an inherent quality of people of all creation 
Self-sufficiency is a permanent attribute of God. He's always self-sufficient. Before we existed, after we exist, Allah is always al-ghani. So God is needless of our existence, let alone our praise and our worship. Allah doesn't need our ibadah. He doesn't need us. Forget about our ibadah. He doesn't need our existence. Surah Ibrahim, verse number 8. Just so we can kind of cross-reference some of the Quranic verses to give us a more holistic picture. Allah says in uh, verse number 8 of Surah Ibrahim, وَقَالَ مُوسَى إِن تَكْفُرُوا أَنْتُمْ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَغَنِيٌّ حَمِيدٌ And Moses said to Bani Israel, if you should disbelieve you, Bani Israel, and whoever is on the earth entire, entirely, indeed God is free of need. He's, he's self-sufficient. He's praiseworthy, praiseworthy. And this is presumably an important message that Musa gave to Bani Israel. You know, because Allah saves them from Fir'aun. They are recognized as, as the chosen ones, those who are going to carry the message of God. So to remove any sense of ujb, of self, uh, self-pride, ujb, he reminds them that, listen, don't think that you're doing Allah a favor by carrying his message and worshiping. Even if you are the only group of people who are worshiping God, who are monotheists, and everyone else is a, monoth- is a polytheist, don't be arrogant. Don't have this self-conceit. Because... Even if you reject him and the entire world rejects him, he doesn't need you. Allah is al ghani al hamid Verse number 16. If he wills, again, elaborating on this attribute of al ghani to be self Allah says, if he wills, verse 16 says, if he wills, he can do away with you. And bring forth a new creation. Sometimes we think we're so important as individuals, as a nation, as a civilization, as a race. We think that we're indispensable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this context, Allah says that I can make you all disappear. I can make you vanish. And this underlines Allah's Self-sufficiency. He doesn't need you. And if he gets rid of you, it won't affect anything. It won't change anything. So this underlines Allah's ghina, that he's al-ghani, and it also reminds us of our poverty again. It also underlines the utter poverty of human beings in that God's making them disappear depends only upon his will. What does it take for Allah to completely eradicate us? Does it take Allah? No. His will. If He wills to wipe us out, to wipe out everything, that's it. That's all that needs to happen. His will is sufficient. Whether we like it or not, or we put up a fight, or we try to... None of that will help. His will is sufficient for us to be eradicated. So... Verses like this should also humble us before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should remind ourselves that if Allah wills, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can replace us with people who are more devoted and obedient to Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you if you don't want to be a bearer of His message, you know, don't worry about Islam. Islam will survive. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you don't appreciate the ni'mah of guidance. Allah will replace you with someone else. There are others that Allah can bring who are more obedient, who are more more devoted. So we should never think that we're special and we're unique and we're indispensable. Each and every one of us, if Allah wills, He can replace us. He can bring forth a new creation. He can bring forth others who are more devoted and more obedient to Him. وَمَا ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ بِعَزِيز And that is not difficult for Allah to completely replace us, to re- eradicate us and replace us, this is not difficult. You and I might think that this is, how can this happen? It's a very difficult process. 
It's absolutely not. In fact, as I've written here, nothing is difficult for So when we say it is not difficult for God, nothing is difficult for Allah. Because He has power over all things. There is nothing that can oppose Him. And there is nothing that can impede Him. Because everything exists through Him. So there is no opposing power. There is no counter force. Everything that exists, exists because of Him. It's dependent on Him. And therefore, there is nothing that is difficult. Difficulty and ease, these are states that are relative to us, to contingent beings who have limited power. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, nothing is difficult for him. Surah Luqman verse 28, Allah says, مَا خَلْقُكُمْ وَلَا بَعْثُكُمْ إِلَّا كَنَفْسٍ وَاحِدًا إِنَّ اللَّهِ سَمِيعٌ بَصِيرٌ Your creation and your resurrection as human beings, creating all human beings and resurrecting all human beings in the trillions maybe, billions and trillions, will not be but as that of a single soul. It's nothing, just like one soul. And God is hearing and seeing. Allah in Surah An-Nahl verse 40, He says, إِنَّمَا قَوْلُنَا, قولنا لِشَيْءٍ إِذَا أَرَدْنَا Indeed, our word to a thing, when we intend it, is but that we say to it, be, and it is. That's it. That's it. Nothing else needs to happen. Allah's will is sufficient. Verse number 18. وَإِن تَدْعُ مُثْقَلَةٌ إِلَىٰ حِمْلِهَا لَا يُحْمَلْ مِنْهُ شَيْءٌ وَلَوْ كَانَ ذَا قُرْبًا إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَيْبِ وَأَقَامُ الصَّلَاةَ وَمَنْ تَزَكَّى فَإِنَّمَا يَتَزَكَّى لِنَفْسِهِ وَإِلَى اللَّهِ الْمَصِيرُ And none shall bear the burden of another. And though one burdened heavily calls for his burden to be carried, none of it will be carried, even if it be a close relative. You can only warn those who fear their Lord in the unseen and establish and have established prayer. And whoever purifies himself only purifies himself for, for the benefit of his soul. And to God is the journey's end. About the day of judgment the, the idea of accountability Everyone be, will be accountable for themselves No one can carry the burden of Of others There's a narration Fi hadithin an Ibn Abbas There's a narration from Ibn Abbas Which is presumably from the Prophet Anna umman wabnaha وَابْنَهَا يَأْتِيَانِ فِي يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ وَكُلٌّ مِنْهُمَا عَلَيْهِ ذُنُوبٍ كَثِيرًا So the Prophet gives us a scene of the Day of Judgment. So it seems that this is not just one case. There will be many cases where this will happen. A mother and her son will be brought forward on the Day of Resurrection. And both will be carrying the burden of many sins. They, both of them. Mother has many sins. Son has many sins. وَتَطْلُبُ الْأُمُّ مِنْ إِبْنِهَا أَنْ يَحْمِلَ عَنْهَا بَعْضَ تِلْكَ الْمَسْئُولِيَاتِ The mother will then ask her son to carry the burden of some of her sins as compensation. Compensation for what? For carrying him in her womb, for raising him. She'll say that I brought you up, I, I fed you, I clothed you, I carried you. For nine months, sleepless nights, you know what mothers do for their children. What will be the answer? What will be the answer? The son will say. Please distance yourself from me, for I am in a worse situation than you. Not that, than you. 
Can you imagine that day where even the son will not be willing to even carry some of the burden of his mother? Shows you how, how difficult and how terrifying that day will be. So in this context, so this verse, verse, verse 18, the idea of carrying that everyone will carry their own burden. And even if you have a heavy burden and you cry out for others to carry it for you, no one will carry that burden for you, even if they're the closest relatives. Now, in this context, the verse can be understood as the introduction of a new discussion. That, it, that the past verses covered a topic and the topic has now come to an end and now we're introducing a new, a new topic. There's a new discussion. So some have said that verse 18 begins a new, new conversation. Other scholars have said, no, we can connect it to the previous verses in that being poor, because it was speaking about our relationship with Allah, that he is the self-sufficient and we are his dependents. We are needy. So some say that it's connected to the previous verses in that being poor in relation to God also means that one cannot take on the burden of another or cast your burden upon another human being since we human beings are powerless to make those determinations. It's not up to us. It's not up to us to, to make those decisions, to make those determinations. So we are faqir even in that sense, that we don't even have control over what happens to us on the Day of Judgment. That Allah has His own system, the malaika are the administrators, and we are powerless to even make these determinations. إِنَّمَا تُنْذِرُ الَّذِينَ يَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَيْبُ وَأَقَامُ الصَّلَاةِ You can only warn those who fear their Lord in the unseen and have established prayer. So here are the Prophet's warnings, because the Prophet is Bashir and he's Nadir, he's a warner. Allah says that your warnings will only impact those hearts that are receptive, that are sound. And the hearts that are sound and receptive are those hearts that are inclined to believe in a higher power, in a transcendent reality that is acquainted with the visible and with the invisible, the apparent world and the unseen world. And those who have that type of belief, because a, a belief is not a real belief if it is not reflected in our actions. So those who will be impacted by your words, Ya Rasulullah, are those who have reverence for this higher power. And this belief is reflected in their prayers because they yearn to connect with this majestic creator. Because salah is, represents our connection with Allah. They have this yearning to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to connect with that higher power. These are the types of hearts that, that you can have an impact on. You know, hearts like the hearts of Salman and Abu Dhar, even before they officially became Muslim, their heart, the ground was already prepared in their hearts to accept because they had certain qualities that made their hearts more receptive than others. وَمَنْ تَزَكَّى فَإِنَّمَا يَتَزَكَّى لِنَفْسِهِ And whoever purifies, only purifies himself for the benefit of his soul. Any good that you do, you are the, you are the, the, the first beneficiary. When you abstain from evil, you are the first beneficiary. You've protected yourself first and foremost from that harm, from damaging your soul. And in fact, as we said, as I've said on many occasions, Jannah and Jahannam are largely projections of the soul. Right. In the same way that that people are the fuel of Jahannam, that the, the evil, wretched souls of the wicked, they are, they're the fuel of Jahannam, meaning they give Jahannam its reality. Similarly, the people of Jannah, there cannot be Jannah without Ahlul Jannah. Ahlul Jannah, the people of paradise, their spirituality, the purity of their hearts create that atmosphere. Because Jannah is also largely the projection of the human soul. 
So paradise and hellfire cannot exist independently. They are created and fueled by the souls, the souls of people, the souls of jinn. So women tazakka fa inna ma yatazakka linafs. You purify your soul. You, it, you, this is for your own benefit. Wa ila Allah al As the time of salah is approaching, we'll just cover this quickly, and inshallah, uh, next week we'll go back to our regular time and we'll be able to take uh, questions. Wa ila Allah al The end of verse number eighteen. And to God is the journey's end. To God is the journey's end. Every human being is on a journey. Whether they like it or not, whether they realize it or not, this is a journey. The starting point is dunya. And the ending point, of course, is when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this journey is inescapable. It's an inescapable reality. So the condition of our souls when we reach the end of this journey will determine our eternal abode. As Allah says, Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi. O mankind, indeed you are laboring toward your Lord with great exertion until you meet him. So liqa'ullah, this is the end. Meeting God. Some of us have the opportunity to meet him here. We purify our souls, we remove the veils, and we can experience liqa'ullah. And there are those, so this liqa, this meeting with Allah, it's going to happen. Some of and it's either we can, this can happen voluntarily. We meet Allah in this life. We encounter Him. You know, the opportunity is there to meet Allah, to have an encounter with Him. But most, many people, unfortunately, they will meet Allah against their will. Against their will. Against their will on the day of judgment. This is when they will, they will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, وَإِلَى اللَّهِ الْمَصِيرِ that Eventually, the, the journey's end is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to pay attention to the condition. We have to ensure that the soul, you know, in the same way that when you have a meeting with an important person, you prepare for that meeting. You make sure you groom yourself, you wear your best clothes, you beautify yourself because you want to appear beautiful and attractive during that meeting. We want the same with, with our meeting with Allah. And what matters the most is not the appearance of our bodies. What is most important is the appearance of our souls when we experience this liqa, liqa Allah. So with that, I think I'll conclude the discussion for uh, this evening. I'm so sorry I'm, uh, I had to change the time for this week. But inshallah, next Wednesday, we will go back to our uh, regularly uh, scheduled session. Inshallah, if you have any questions or comments, we can uh, postpone them for uh, for next week as the time of salah has set in. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin.